I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and I eat well and I grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. When I have to face the realities of the results of our current educational system, I find myself thinking about children and how these same children are echoing the sentiments of Langston Hughes decades ago. Not only are these children asking and saying they too are America, they're asking a different question and saying, if we are America, then why are these our lived experiences? And not only are our children asking that question, our parents are asking the same. So many of our parents have thought something's wrong with their child or something's wrong with them. But as they have navigated this educational system, they've come to realize that inequity runs deep. And so even our parents are grassroots networks of advocacy trying to ensure that this system fulfills the promise that it said that it would. And not only do our children and our parents have this rallying cry about, we are American, our field is asking similar questions about who in the United States gets access to literacy and who does not. You see, in 2018, TNTP did a study and they found that 82% of teachers supported the Common Core state standards. But only 44% of teachers actually believed that their children would meet it. And this resulted in 133 hours of below grade level tasks. And TNTP didn't stop there. They decided to compare classrooms and they found something else. That classroom that had predominantly white students had 54 more percent grade level assignments, four times more grade level lessons, and 23 more percent engagement. You see, TNTP calls this the provision gap. And when they discuss the provision gap, they're discussing how systems and structures have been put into play that are not all children benefit. You see, I took a, a road of saying, I wanted to dig underneath this a little bit more and not just build a whole platform on my thinking on what TNTP resulted in 2018. I decided to take a deeper look and think about the systemic ways in which the United States of America has created inequity. You see, almost 90 years ago, the United States of America engaged in a, a systemic intentional action of redlining. You see, redlining is all about labeling different parts of our neighborhoods, you know, an A, C, a D. And with those labels came economic disparity, with those labels came restrictions on resources. And what you all are looking at here today is a map of inequality, the redlining map of New Orleans where I currently reside. 
And I'm sure many of you all can infer what the red means. But what's sad to me is that although redlining started about 90 years ago, these same areas that are in the red represent high poverty, represent illiteracy, and represent some of the lowest performing schools in the city. You see, redlining has legs and it's been persistent. And sometimes I ask myself this question, what type of MTS system do we have where the majority of the city is in the red? And what's deeply troubling to me is that although this is about 90 years old, the history of inequity runs deep. And even before then, you see, in 1865, in our history, we had anti-literacy laws that if you were a once enslaved African, you were beat, fined, or jailed just because you wanted to experience the fruits of liberty, of literacy. And beyond that, our history shows us that we've, we've forced assimilation on our indigenous populations. Some of you all may remember how it used this phrase they used to say, kill the Indian and save the man. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, the black community asked for equitable resources. And in 1982, immigrants are asking for equitable access. And in 1998, our multilingual learners were fighting against our English only mandate. You see, some of you all may look at this timeline and think about, you know, literacy access. But to be honest with you, for me, it's the timeline of inequity. And so can we be surprised that as recent as 2019, these are our results? That in the United States of America, we can predict based on your race, your socioeconomic status, and even your learning needs, if you'll be a proficient reader or not. We've been at this a long time, you all. If proficiency has been our aim, it's clear that pro the provision gap has been an indictment against our educational system for years. There's an accumulation of illiteracy and some of us may call this an achievement gap, but Gloria Lansing Billings pushes us to consider that this is an educational debt. And I would be remiss if I were to present this or paint this picture as if my own self has not been a recipient of this debt. You see, I have memories as early as seven years old in first grade, looking at a report card in which I received a D in reading. And as you all can only imagine being a first grader and seeing that the one thing that you're supposed to know how to do in school, you don't know how to do. And you're forced to go to summer school and nobody realizes that this was the beginning of my inferiority complex. I matriculated into second grade and I remember this teacher conference and that teacher told my mother that 
she would never give me anything more than a C because she was afraid that it would deter my motivation. You see, at the early age of eight, I was already learning to mistrust this system. But my journey doesn't stop there because I can remember in middle school, sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher saw me for the first time and she said, you belong in gifted reading. And she doesn't realize if I can pay her homage today, she doesn't realize the how she just lit up something that had been dormanted in me for so long that I had worth and I had value. This was the beginning from sixth grade to seventh grade of my textual lineage. In my middle school years, I was growing against what we would call the staircase of complexity, but I would be remiss if I don't call out one of the most pivotal texts in my childhood. My eighth grade African-American social studies teacher told me to read Roll Up Thunder, Hear My Cry. And for the first time, I got to see myself, my people, my community, our history. My teachers don't realize that they are the impetus for establishing my reading life. But as you can imagine, that reading life didn't stop there in middle school. It matriculated as I moved to my traditional teacher program. What you all are seeing here is actually the poster from my final year. You know, we all had that poster session where you were supposed to present what you learned about education. Can you see it? Can you see? That before I walked into the classroom, the thing I wanted to know the most was how do we teach our children how to read? Is it basils? Is it whole language? Is it foundational skills? Is it literature circles? I wanted to know because I wanted to be that teacher. But you all know the most troubling fact about my poster is a couple of months ago, I found it through an email, an image. And my eyes zoned in on the conclusion. And in my conclusion, I wrote, there is no single strategy that proved to be the best. Yes, my college professors allowed me to enter into the classroom steeped in this belief. And so what did that do for me? These became a part of my textual lineage. I voraciously read these texts because this is what was put before me that this was how I was gonna make a difference for my children and my classroom. And it wasn't until I found myself as a school administrator in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans that I said, enough is enough. You see, in this school, the average household income was about $30,000 a year. In this school, mental health ran rapid. In this school, teachers lack efficacy. This was a failing school when I took it over. Only about 20% of the kids were reading on grade level. And here I was, a school administrator, a doc student. And I asked myself this question, hmm, Mitchell, if you're studying all this about school improvement, why don't you study the very thing that your students need? Hmm. This text became a part of my textual lineage as well. The National Reading Panel Report 
I remember it like it was yesterday. That weekend of my enough is enough, my defining moment. I found myself combing through this page. And can I tell you all? This text began to be the birthplace of the shift in my mindset and my actions. This text equipped my teachers with practices that made them more intentional. This text is the reason why my children began to smile. As they said, Dr. Brookins, I'm learning to read. But my textual energy doesn't stop there. Once I had that shift, I had to dig deeper into the work and I found myself, simple view of reading, understanding that there are two major capacities that yield proficient reading. And that meant that if I was going to align myself to that evidence base, I had to uproot meaning-based instructional practices and ensure that my children had access to a literacy block in which, yes, they built the skills and mastered the code, but also they strategically learned how to extract and construct meaning from print. And my sexual lineage and journey doesn't stop there because I then dug deeper into the four-part processor. And what did I learn? I learned that there are regions of part of our brain that are interconnected. They work together so that yes, we can recognize words, understand words. And what did this mean for me as a school leader? This means that I had to pull the weeds of three cueing out and ensure that my teachers understood that the best cue to a word is the word itself. And not only did I learn about the four part processor, I dug into Erie's phases of word reading development. And as a leader, I learned that yes, our children grow on a continuum from leveraging visual cues to those you know, initial and final phonemes to those internal clusters until then being able to deconstruct polysyllabic words. And upon knowing that, that meant that as a leader, I had to do some heavy work, you all. And I had to uproot that A to Z leveling system. No longer were we saying children were at a level H, but we began to say that they're at the full alphabetic phase. And this time, it meant something. It meant that we had a clearer pathway to move our children to a place where they can access text independently. And not only was it important to learn those things, but it was also important for me not to be too general when it comes to the five pillars. Not just knowing that these five things are ingredients to read an instruction, but understanding that that meant that ineffective practices that have no evidence base have no place in the school. And so I adopted structured literacy. And how can I forget the impact of Scarborough's rope? So often we, we're we very broad, you know, back in the day, we were very broad in our understanding that, you know, saying things like, well, the child has a comprehension issue or a word recognition issue. But what Scarborough's rope does is it extends the conversation and allows us to see the subcategories underneath those major capacities. And so what did that mean for me as a leader? That meant, Dr. Brooklyn, stop being broad. But create an assessment system in your school that has screeners, diagnostics, and probes so that you can truly understand what your children need and ultimately provide prescriptive diagnostic instruction. Hmm. So what does this mean for us? What does it mean for the knowledge that I've gained? What does it mean for what I want to do today? I beseech all of you all to think about, do you have a multi-tiered system of support? 
Do you have a tier one time that results in most students learning how to read? And then do you have sacred time to provide the most vulnerable populations in your school what you owe them? But beyond those systems, it also means that we have to ensure that the foundational skills instructional block of time, are children having multiple varied at bats with mastering the code? Are they cementing their graphing, phoning, correspondencing through phoning, graphing, mapping? Are we bringing spelling back so that children actually learn transcription skills? And if we're so big on trying to ensure that kids develop that oral reading fluency, how much time in our school is spent on connected text? And beyond those foundational skills instructions, what about the children who have language variations? What about our multilingual learners and students who actually have different dialects? What about them? Are they allowed to have learning opportunities where they can leverage what they know about their own language to learn a new language? And why do our multilingual learners have to choose? Why can't they just be masters of both? Especially when we now know that the research is clear that people who are bilingual actually have more gray matter. That means that that executive functioning skills are active and high. About knowledge. We can not only just think about foundational skills, but we have to understand the impact of knowledge. Take a look at this paragraph. Read it to yourself. As it reaches your body, pause briefly and then exhale while using your arms to push it up. Focus on the smooth and controlled movement. Pause briefly and then exhale. What is this about? Can you guess? Your background knowledge gives you the power to scan, to extract, but even more, create that integrated mental model that is so necessary for reading. And not only does knowledge matter, we have to think to ourselves, what about the instruction that's happening in classroom that allows children to acquire that knowledge? Are we ensuring that children's vocabulary breadth and depth is being cultivated? When we know that children have to access complex texts, are we ensuring that children understand and know and have the ability to deconstruct complex sentences? And what about text structure? Are we ensuring that our children actually know text structure, the signals, the cohesive devices that allows them to organize information in the text? You see, knowledge and strategy instruction are not at odds, but they work in concert to ensure that children leave our buildings being proficient readers who not only can access text, but can do something with it. You know, when I think about comprehension instruction, I have to understand that there's multiple processes involved. From the micro process of lifting words off a page, all the way to the micro processes of understanding what are you taking away from a text? You see, as practitioners, we also have to understand that comprehension is thinking, is dynamic. It's a moment by moment interchange between the reader and that text. And as practitioners, we have to ensure that we are moving children from the surface code all the way through to ensure that they have a comprehensive, accurate representation of text. 
But I would be remiss if I would have you all think that the science of reading alone is going to cut it. You see, the science of reading is great. The science of reading is effective, but it's also insufficient. You see, we're not just building people's knowledge of instruction. We also need to build our knowledge of implementation. We, are to, we have to understand the stages of implementation as we are turning the tide towards evidence-based instruction wherever you are on this journey. You have to understand how you design the initiative, how you put systems and structures in place to support your initiative. And when you start to implement it, you don't leave it alone. As leaders, you examine it. You examine the results to see what needs to shift, what needs more support, what needs to be cut. But even more, sometimes I think this is a mistake in how we think about these change efforts. We don't go into it with sustainability in mind. You see, at that final stage, that full stage of implementation, this is the stage in which your staff will be able to implement evidence-based practices at the level of unconscious competence. That means they can do this in their sleep. But what does that mean for us as leaders? That means we have to understand what works in school. You see, we found out almost 20 years ago that professional development and coaching is important. They both increase teacher knowledge. They both increase teacher skill. But there's only one that transfers, and it's coaching. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, how often are our teachers being coached? And what's the quality of that coaching? Is it student-centered? Or is it just a meeting where we're just explaining and talking? But despite all that, and what we know, this is the principal's desk. Would you agree? that our principals have to think about letters, vendors, MTSS, curriculum, test, state test, PD vendors, student behavior, parents, all of this is at the desk. And sometimes as much as we vilify our principals, who's gonna help our principals declutter? You see, our principals need to begin to think about if they want evidence-based practices to take root in their schools, what are they going to start, stop, and continue? You see, you can't declutter your desk if you don't attend to this intellectual process. And that means whatever you start, what is the evidence base? Is it aligned to research and what research? Has it been proven to work and to what degree? And whatever you decide to continue, because you know in education, we don't like to stop things. We just like to add things and keep doing things, right? And so you have to ask yourself this question before you start celebrating and continuing things, do you actually have valid results? But I would say the one of the most important things that we have to do as leaders You've got to ensure and you've got to diagnose if what you're requiring of your staff, of your teachers, is it causing harm? Are you draining the morale of your team? And sometimes it doesn't cause harm, but guess what? It has no impact. And as people and as we begin to turn this tide, we have to ask ourselves that critical question. 
if it has no impact, if it's harming our system, you got to begin to say to yourself, how am I going to navigate and ensure that that thing does not take root and does not persist? And so that means as a leader, you've got to think about what's keeping you up at night. What can you influence that you know others need to address? But here's where you have to spend most of your time. If you want the tide to turn, you've got to think about the priority that you have the decision-making power to change. And I say that because so often when it's time to de-implement, it's time to get rid of the clutter, I find that we, we get so stuck into the system this and the system that, instead of saying, hold up, what can you control? What do you have the decision-making power to do to make this change? We're so often talking about a system and not realizing that we are the system. And what we do contributes to the system. And so as a leader, you've got to make that decision on what's on your stop list. And the reason why that stop list is so important is because this is a harsh reality of our system. Hmm. When I think about the reality that the legs of our system has proven that anything that we start today may not actually be here next year. The pendulum keeps swinging. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that as a system, we need to de-implement. But if you all allow me, I think there's another culprit as well as to why sometimes, as much as we want to see equitable progress, doesn't happen. So I submit to you Gorski's work. You see, Gorski in 2019 submitted to us what he called equity detours. In his work, he really talks about the lived experiences of children of color and how when educational equity, specifically racial equity, is the aim, this is how the system responds, with privilege, excuses of poverty, deficit thinking, and the patchwork of diversity. And so I want to use this as a lens and a framework to also share with you all that in this time, this defining moment, as we do this work, we're going to have to navigate these equity detours as well. You see, that first equity detour focuses on privilege. And Gorski says, in too many schools, the pace of equity progress prioritizes the comfort and the interests of people who have the least interest in that progress. You see, instead of centering the needs of children of color, we center the needs of the dominant culture. I see that same thing happening in literacy because it's so sad to see that we have people who are saying things like, I can't believe we're changing reading instruction for 10 to 15% of the student population. Instead of them decentering themselves, instead of them recognizing that they are already literate, they're not centering the most vulnerable population. Gorski also talks about poverty. 
And how the result is that we too often attribute educational disparities to students' culture. You know, we tend to act like the reason why black boys are suspended two times to five times more than white males is because they don't know how to act right. Instead of owning the fact that in our system, we have zero tolerance policies that are actually exacerbating the issue. And I see the same thing happening in our field around literacy. As soon as we're trying to push for equitable outcome and equitable teaching, we have people who are so focused on, well, poverty is the reason why children can't read. And because I'm at a Title I school, that means that these kids can. And if we take it even further, the deficit mindsets that are pervasive in education, Gorski talks about that equity initiatives should focus on eliminating the conditions that marginalize students, never on fixing students. You know, I often walk into schools and we'll have these behavior management systems. And once you really talk to the staff and understand the belief systems behind the behavior management system, it's rooted in their deficit beliefs about the group of students that they serve. And so for me, when are we going to stop allowing people to say what kids can't? Because when I walk into classrooms, I don't see this as all children's fault. When I walk into districts that don't have the right assessment systems, when I walk into schools that don't have an effective coaching model, when I walk into schools and I realize that the materials that teachers are using are not even aligned to the research. The preponderance of evidence doesn't make me blame children. It makes me look at the adults. And finally, Gorski ends his work by saying, there's a diversity to detour as well. You know that diversity detour where it creates the illusion of diversity while it's entrenched in inequity? I'm sure you all seen this. The diverse text that they say is diverse. But we all know that's Mary had a little lamb. And all you did was color that face black. And so instead of you talking of creating the diversity appreciation, you're actually entrenching the inequity because all this is is an illustration of minstrelsy and blackface. And how does that show up in our classrooms today? Have y'all seen this? Schools that have decodables, level readers, units of study, you fly, Hegarty. You've got all the things. And you're, and you're parading as if this is equitable. But how are you mixing light and darkness? All you're doing is patchwork and saying that you're celebrating science of reading when in actuality, those of us who have the knowledge base can look at what you're doing and see the inequity. Ladies and gentlemen, I humbly submit to you all that these equity detours are real. And as we work together collectively to turn this tide, you're going to have to be prepared for the fact that there are people who are going to center themselves. There are people who are going to have a lot of excuses. There are people who are going to have a deficit thinking about the system, about children, and even themselves. And you've got to look out for the people who are going to try to sell you a story that they're actually doing this work. But you know what? What I'm most excited about today is that we have 
a historical example of how to handle detours. Because you see, turning the tide towards evidence-based practice is a civil right. And so if we're engaged in a civil rights initiative, I think it's important that we use these examples that help us through this defining moment. For there will be times that we're gonna have to boycott ineffective practices. And there will be times that we're gonna have to rally like we're doing today to empower each other, to strengthen each other. But make no mistake, sometimes we're gonna have to stand until change occurs. And let this world know that it's unacceptable to continue to perpetuate the accumulation of malpractice. And as we do all of those things, we're gonna have to remember that the march towards liberty is gonna be an ever pressing need But what's so exciting is that we're already doing it. When I look at all the people who I've met along this journey, who I've seen their work, we have a host of people who have come together converging their interests to ensure that we pay back that educational debt. And so today, I hope that you all will use those change agents because everyone on that list believes that once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. And so with that, I want you all to understand that excuses have no more place. We've allowed this educational debt to accumulate too long. And so the excuses that truly build bridges to nowhere and monuments of nothingness are the very things that we're gonna have to take down. And a part of that is all of us collectively working together with one aim and one voice. That literacy is liberty. And so I'm happy today because when I look all around, I know that none of us are alone because we have the strength of each other to continue to turn the tide. Thank you.